You can forget a lot of things, Foster Care Nation, but never forget this. You're listening to Unparalleled Studios. I think no. Foster Care Nation, listen up. That's what I say every week. This week, I want to listen to you guys. If you would, you're going to hear Cheryl talk in this episode a little bit about looking for ways that we can serve foster kids. I'd love to hear your suggestions. Also, you can leave us some stories. If you have a story or something you'd like to share, something that we can play on the podcast episode, give us a call at 413-FOSTER-3. Again, that's 413-367-8373. And let us know if you have any ideas. Foster Care Nation, listen up. This is... Foster Care and Unparalleled Journey. Strength for the powerless. Courage for the fearful. Hope and healing for wounded hearts. Hello and welcome back to Foster Care, an unparalleled journey with Jason and Amanda. And today we have Cheryl Williams with us. So Cheryl, how are you doing today? I am doing great. Thanks for having me on. How are you two? We are doing great as well. So I, I was looking at your story. I was looking at your website. And by the way, if you want to find some of what Cheryl does, you can find it at fundfc.org. So fund foster care, I'm assuming is what the FC stands for, .org. It's a part of her 501c3 organization, and that is kind of amazing how far you've come in helping kids and helping foster care, especially once we, we dive into your story. Can you tell us just a little bit about how you got involved in the foster care system? Yeah, I started really young. Foster care has unfortunately always been a part of my family story since I was young. Maybe even one of my first memories, I called 911 because I saw my sister being abused Uh, My mom just had her held up against a wall, cursing at her, and I shared a room with my sister, and I knew how sad she could be, like, why don't mom and dad love me, and at the time, I was the youngest of four kids, and she was the oldest, and so she was six years older than me. I didn't really know what was going on. I just knew she was being abused, and I was not at the time, for sure, so she, I didn't want to run away with her. I just wanted her to be safe. And so I remember helping her run away and being really private about it, kind of covering up, you know, that spot on the bed. So nobody would know she was gone for a while. And um, and she would run away to a church friend that really treated her like family for a while. And so um, I always thought about her. And then when she left and she was in foster care, I would constantly be pulled out of school, first grade through third grade, especially when we lived in Pennsylvania. She was in foster care in the Pennsylvania foster care system. And so the counselor would pull me out and be like, is your dad touching you inappropriately? Is everything going on, you know, at home okay? And I later found out it was because my sister was constantly concerned about me that when she was gone, it is very typical of abused families to only pick on one kid at a time. <laughs> so the other kids are like, oh, my parents aren't abusive at all. But, you know, if you pick on all your kids, you know, you're more likely to go to jail. But if you pick on one at a time and you make that one person out to be like, this is absurd, they're a liar, they're a rebellion, you really can get away with being abusive. So that was kind of my family story is once my sister was in foster care, the abuse started, I was about seven years old and it was all kinds of abuse that occurred, but I'd be cooking for the family. I had a lot of chores from the time she left and I was cooking breakfast, lunch and dinner for my family. And I was kind of a last key kid, often left out of the house. Nobody was home to, to watch out for me, but you know, what I was really proud of is that even after my sister leaving and I cried myself to sleep every night, I was a straight A student, but that was kind of my way of dealing with it is that I immersed myself in books. I immersed myself in like, I just didn't want to go into the foster care system 
because my dad would tell me these horrible stories, like your sister's being raped every single day. And, oh, I just, I didn't even know she was alive. I didn't get to see her anymore. So yeah, it, I got exposed to the foster care system that way. There were court hearings when my sister went into foster care and I was asked to possibly testify against my parents or my sister, or whatever I thought. And I was really torn. Like they fought. I don't really know what was going on. I just knew my sister, she wasn't happy or feeling safe. Um, my dad had had a gun and, you know, she woke up in the middle of the night, like there was a gun right there to her head. <laughs> that was pretty scary. And I had those experiences too when I was a teenager at home. So I really could vouch for her story being exactly like mine, but it wasn't until I was a teenager myself that the abuse got really bad. My dad moved me to Alabama. Like Chicago was our hometown. I was born there. We were all born there. Um, but he moved us to different states. So when he moved me to Alabama, my brothers were still teenagers, but he didn't allow them to come this, which was really weird. Like he just left them in one of his um, apartment complexes that he managed. And so one was a senior in high school and the other one was like a freshman, sophomore in college, but they were both under 19. And <clears throat> Yeah, so I was alone as a 15-year-old girl in Alabama. I didn't know anybody, didn't know the culture. And the abuse was just very intense once it was just me and my parents there. My dad had a job. That was his excuse for moving us there. And he lost it within a month and just did nothing but abuse me. And I was a very lost, troubled teen, <laughs> pretty angry, frankly. And I just like I kind of always had a heart for kids. Like I always listened to what my peers had said. Like I didn't like when my friends were like, nobody takes me seriously as a kid. I can't do what I want. Like I always feel like I just was made to be a child as a kid, that I've always seen the kid's point of view in things and been kind of weary of adults because that was my experience with nearly all adults. <laughs> I've known some corrupt adults and but the kids always just seemed like innocent and ambitious and and I've always wanted to support kids so because of my experiences I'm sure it made me that way but when I went into foster care it wasn't really my story that made me this passionate child advocate it was hundreds if not thousands of kids that I lived with from babies this one baby was thrown out of a window, all bones broken pretty much. And because she was crying as a baby, like heaven forbid, she cry. And so her dad was in jail for that, but it was just really sad. You know, it made me really angry. Her mom would stop by and just act like nothing happened. It's like, oh, my baby, you know, and be all happy. And it's like, I had to listen to these well as this baby was fed through a feeding tube. And she did eventually die in foster care. So I mean, just sob. It's just there's so many stories. And I lived in a group home with all teens, and their stories probably affected me more than anybody of just how many of us get into foster care, whether they're special needs and their parents didn't want them or couldn't afford to take care of them with their special needs or the kids that were born into foster care and then had babies into foster care. And I took care of this one lady's baby. I didn't even know it was hers. I got moved seven times in the one year I was in foster care as a teen before I got emancipated early. And the reason I got emancipated early, that means um, like I'm not a ward of the state anymore, was because I was trying to have a job. <laughs> and I actually had three jobs, but every single time I was working extra hours as a teen. I needed my social worker to sign off on. And my social worker was extremely busy with all these caseloads and just didn't have time for it. So I waited a couple of months of my life just to be able to work. And there's so much red tape. And so, I mean, just that I had these front seat experiences of the foster care system really made me, I think, about as passionate of a uh, child advocate it's not really foster care advocate because you know I'm not like supportive of the system I and mean, I'd be fine with abolishing the system if we had a, a much safer system but it, it is just completely seeing the children's perspective from birth even like these kids that 
like you, you said right before we started recording, you have a baby right there that was born addicted to drugs. That is so common among babies in foster care. And they have to combat delays because somebody didn't look after it, like try to protect them from delays, you know, in it starts in pregnancy. And so my early childhood degree and that human development classes really just showed me like, you know, just to be loving it's as a parent starts in pregnancy and then every stage just respecting children's development that we're all like in progress but children are not just little mini adults you know that they we're all in progress and just recognizing what they're already able to do and building from there one step at a time there's no there's no rush on development and we all do things at our own pace and we all have our very special intelligences so I'm also really an advocate of those with special needs, like try to find love. Like I am really against finding a cure for autism. I have a boy with autism. You really wouldn't know it because if you just nurture somebody's individual development and you're really patient, because he didn't start talking until he was like seven or eight. He was my little monkey. <laughs> I just wanted to be a monkey, but he just refused to talk, you know, and he would throw temper tantrums and not make eye contact. And, but one day he started talking a bit and what a happy day that was. But you just have to, you just have to recognize that, you know, he had gifts. You really couldn't see them until he started talking because he's gifted in math and science for sure. He's just like a little um, savant genius in those ways, but he just seemed delayed when he was in pre-K, especially with absolutely no speech and so just really nurturing and seeing the best in your kids, like every kid I really believe can be successful in their own ways. You know, like Beethoven likely had autism. That's what my son says. <laughs> I just take his word for it. He's always filled with that. But, you know, that just parents really need to love their kids, like with a forever love. I understand it can get so hard. It can get expensive. It can get intense. Like if you've ever had your kids taken away, or really hang in there with all that you need to do to get your kids back. But I just love love and especially parental love. I think that can be the strongest out there. And it's discouraging when I see parents who have really bad attitudes towards their kids. Like your kids were not asked to come into this world. It's the least you can do to take care of them, really. I know you don't get like a cookie if you're a good parent or anything, but I mean, just to have that motherly or fatherly type of love, like I want every advantage possible for my kids. I want them to succeed is what I, I do think we need to have as, as human beings to care for our own young and just do what it takes to, to keep your kids Hey there, Foster Care Nation. We'd like to take a quick minute to step out of the podcast here and ask you guys for a little bit of support. If you could share an episode with people, friends, in a group, with family, anywhere where there's somebody who would like to hear this. Also, if you'd like to join us and support our mission, a couple dollars a month would be really helpful. You can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash foster care nation. Now back to the show. You know... Cheryl, as I listen to you talk, it's really obvious that you have a passion for kids and, and your story tells me why, you know, it's, you came from a place where, where not only were you in that system, but you were in that system with a lot of other kids and heard a lot of other kids stories and you know, the damage that can be done there. And as much as I, I would love to be able to abolish a foster care system because we didn't need it anymore. Unfortunately, there's not a better alternative that I have found yet for most kids and unfortunately even more so there's going to be some some portion of the foster care system who are going to be people who don't do it for the right reason who have some sort of ulterior motive or maybe they have good motives and just don't have the right coping skills and, and you know that some of the things that you deal with with some of these kids can be really difficult and hard and and so just from the foster parent experience side of it some of this is really hard and most all of it is very, very, very much worth it in the long run. But to have that view of the kid who's been through some hard times, who's spent time talking with kids who's been through those hard times, what do you think is, is the best thing that, that just the average person can do 
to try and help that system maybe turn out a better person? That's a great question. And really, my simple answer to that is just empathy, that so many people come from it of this place of like charity, that I want to do something for underprivileged kids when really my superpower is just understanding the needs and not everybody's needs are exactly the same but just listening paying attention to what the kid is actually saying that they need (laughs) you know they're going to be the best advocate of just if you meet the kids needs you are a wonderful child advocate you're benefiting their lives and of course parenting there's a difference between what they want and what they need but really listening to what they need is how to benefit their lives So there's a lot of ways, fortunately, that we can make a difference in their life. (laughs) I have like 300 causes that I try to support, which it's hard for me to narrow it down because there's a lot of things people can do. You can fundraise for scholarships for these kids to help pay for their expenses when they're aging out. You can foster, you can adopt. If you foster or adopt, I just really ask that you come at it from a place of I feel like a lot of people have fear, you know, because you don't know this kid, you don't know how it's going to change your life, but come at it from a place of love, of just being open-hearted and being very understanding that to me, it makes the most sense. Like if I'm taking in a kid, I'm actually expecting them to test me. I'm expecting them to have maximum trust issues. I'm expecting them to push me and be like, you don't really love me. You know, you're just maybe in and for the money or something like that. I'm expecting that because I understand the way it felt. I knew, you know, there are some people that do it for the money and some kids have these experiences. So they're biased against you when they come into your home. But really just being a genuine, authentic person, it's like, I'm not doing it even for like a higher place in heaven that I think I'll have or like recognition from my peers, but I am doing it because I love you, that I truly see you as a kid, my kid, you know, I want the best for you so badly that, I mean, I'll work hard to meet your needs. I'll work hard to earn your trust that I love you unconditionally. It's really what these kids need. So whatever your motives are, I mean, I just think before you do it, just make sure the difference between being a bad foster parent and a good foster parent is just motives to me. Just if you really come at it with good intentions of, I have a wonderful opportunity to purely love a child and change their life for the better by mentoring them, by being like a school counselor type of listening to what their dreams are and helping to make that happen. You can do amazing miracles in these kids' lives. But yeah, I mean, you don't really make much money anyways from foster care. A lot of us that are in in foster care types of circles know that that's just really a bad rap that can go on. Some do try, but I mean, I think they learn pretty quickly. There's a lot easier ways to make money (laughs) than foster care, but still, yeah, just come in it like a parent, you know, just like you would your own kids. And I personally believe like if you're not in it to keep these kids possibly forever, I mean, but also be willing to give them up if they do go back to their biological parents, like, probably just shouldn't do it because you just have to have a heart for it's not all about my feelings it's not all about what I get from it it's about doing what's in the best interest for these kids fighting for the best interest of them being willing to march into a CPS building and say you know what you're forgetting this kid this is not an invisible kid this is a kid I love very dearly and this is what they need and being the eyes and ears for these children is what we need we need plenty more advocates you just one kid at a time is plenty. If everybody could just take in one kid or adopt them and just love them unconditionally with this fierce love that doesn't give up on them, that believes in them, even though a lot of these kids don't know what they want to do. A lot of them feel worthless inside. And so I started my nonprofit because of those feelings of, you know, I even knew I was smart. I skipped a grade when I was younger, but trauma really just seemed to permanently affect my brain. And it's the most frustrating thing that I'm still delving deeper into how to truly repair the brain of like all trauma so that you're just like, you know, your peers that have well-functioning brains, but it's just about self-esteem. And if you do charity work, 
it's hard not to feel like a charity case, you know, like when I was a kid, there were, there was a church to fundraise for me, but they gave me dollar store stuff. And there wasn't stuff that was personalized for me. And I felt like a charity case. I felt like it did more harm than good. But with the nonprofit that I started, it was their only personalized gifts that I handpick out myself because I really enjoy that. And with just empowering notes of just, we are cheering for your success. You keep on building, you keep on loving arts and crafts. Like we're so proud of you, keep going. I mean, just things that are just little reminders, like somebody cared enough to even put in a referral for you. And then we're happy to just keep supporting you, keep sending out stuff until you find your self-esteem. These kids, you know, you have to empower them. They cannot, you cannot just do things for them and help them. The, the best way to help them is just you know, how, help them have their self-confidence, help them find their skill sets, help them find ways that they're loving, help them find causes that they care about and help them get involved in volunteering themselves. Like once I started volunteering, I had a completely different way of thinking that I'm not this evil person that I always thought I was, is my parents told me so or something. And that I really could have a powerful voice in doing good in this world. It's very empowering. Cheryl, I got to know. What was it for you? Because you, you talk about that that need for kids to understand that they are enough and to realize that they can be successful. What was that moment for you where you finally turned that corner and decided I can do something good for others? That is a great question. I'm a very spiritual person, not religious, but spiritual. And it actually just started from a pure point of loving God. God got me through a lot of my hard moments. And so God prepared me for volunteer before I started volunteering that I needed to have a, a solid base. Um, I think there's a lot of codependence that goes on among volunteers where you are doing it for things like you need if you're needy, you know, but God really prepared me for just doing things for just being present in the moment. I started off with the people who had terminal illness that are dying. So it was a very emotional experience, but you know, it didn't hit as home, close to home as foster care. So it was easier for me to do in a lot of ways than foster care advocacy. And um, I, I just being there with somebody and actually having them tell me that it makes such a difference. Me just being there because I felt really worthless. <laughs> I felt super worthless. Like I can't do anything. I don't have any skills. I'm not even a good volunteer, but that they really liked me. They just liked me around. They thought I was high energy. I kind of perked them up. That's like, it, it really, there's no substitute from really seeing with your own eyes, like the impact you're making on people's lives. So that's the only thing that really gives me energy that really empowers me is like, I just feel like I was made to be a caring person and truly show truly show the love of God. The love of God doesn't mean like, oh, I want to be highest and happy. <laughs> I feel like the love of God has always been to me like, I don't, I don't know. I don't need to be better than anybody else. God created all of us. And I feel like he loves us all or he wouldn't have made us so unique and special in our own ways. And it just created me to be like, truly one other people's success, sometimes even more than my own. That's really how I've gotten in trouble sometimes in life. It's just, I lift people up and then they feel like God. And then they just, yeah, put me down and I'm like oh wow I'm back where I started and it hurts every time but I mean it's just their problem <laughs> you know people people aren't perfect and stuff but I have had a lot of really um a lot of encouragement because I do feel like I've actually truly made an impact in quite a few people's lives it's only from my example it's just how I, all the good I found to do and that a lot of people want to and to get into that themselves. It's just, it's a wonderful way to spend your life is just making a positive impact in this world. You know, Cheryl, you mentioned, um, you, you mentioned the spirituality piece as opposed to maybe religion. And, and I, I totally understand what you're saying there, but one of the things that, that you also touched on, on that line is that we all have a purpose. Like if God made this world and he made me and he put me in this time and place, I feel like there's a reason I'm here and I need to get about the business of figuring that out and finding that purpose and living that purpose out to the best of my ability. And it sounds like that's what you're doing is, is living out that purpose that you found. 
Yeah, actually, I forgot. Really, the moment where I went from what was me, um, this little foster girl that's been abused all of her life and to being empowered was I did have a foster mom, like I was never adopted, but she set quite the role model. She had been in foster care since she was like six. And then she'd been in soup, soap operas and was a runway model. And she was just this glamorous celebrity to me. And it kind of took me under her wing. She wasn't licensed for teens, but you know, when I really needed her, I could call her and she was an advocate. So she was um, really just, I thought she was, she was funny she could make friends with anybody she could tell her story with boldness she had every skill imaginable and I wanted to be just like her but I never felt a thing like her because again I felt worthless and powerless and when she came to visit me and said I have terminal cancer (laughs) it's like a part of me died I mean I had always seen her as my soul mama And just imagining her light being gone from this world. I was like, no, this can't be. Um, And she's a miracle worker. So even she's lost her memory, I guess the the cancer and all the trauma from her life, it kind of took her memories away. (laughs) She's a really interesting person still. She's survived like more than 10 years past what doctors thought. So I was warning her as dead like 10 years ago. But I just was like, I have super big shoes to fill that, I mean, I knew I wasn't really like her, but I was like, when she came to visit, she just showed me like anything you can do, like just donate your things to, you know, local, I guess she was saying goodwill, but because she had said that it was like. I researched stuff. I found Veterans Connection and I made friends with the wonderful gal that ran that here in Round Rock. And um, just that's where I would donate all my things to. And I started advocating for veterans and stuff. But just it was her example when she's around, like my spirit is so on fire, just like she has the greatest energy of anybody and I still don't feel like I can really replace her shoes but luckily she's still around she's just this very genuine um amazing woman so that was the difference in which I just felt like it would be a crying shame to lose her example like I had to just I guess pay it for it is how you you'd put it that's really awesome you've done so many wonderful things you know and you've come from so far you know, you're not that little girl anymore. You're a beautiful woman. But what's next? Do you have any other plans? Yeah, there's a lot of exciting things coming up for me. I am doing the social ambassador program. I got invited by Ms. Social Ambassador 2021 to run so that I have a platform for foster kids. So Wait, that's coming I, up in January. Is that Jamerica Haynes? Yes. We've talked with her. Have you interviewed her. her before? Yes, we have talked to her. I, I was, yeah. you said that. I was like, hang on. I know this. I know this. I don't know much about beauty pageants. Trust me. But I know a little bit about that one. Yeah, exactly. I really have tried to stay away from beauty pageants. I don't really like them. But she is just this glowing example. i have like, is, are your teeth real? I've asked her all these awkward questions. She's like, yes, they are. I just take care of them. Like, no, when you're in foster care, you know, I have a couple of tips down there from when I fell off a lat. I mean, you, there's like abuse and neglect. Your teeth are the first to show it. And I mean, she truly, that's her real teeth. <laughs> just like, she was just made to be this glowing example of what a foster kid can become in this world. I love her to pieces. So I was like, yeah, following in her shoes would be wonderful and honor for, for me. So I could win that and then I'd have a platform there. And then also one day before I got invited to go See, I don't, I don't even watch TV, so this is embarrassing. But it's like Emmys, is Emmys coming up in January, the end of January? Um, or is it Grammys? One of those award shows. <laughs> so, anyways, I know it's the most awkward thing because I get invited to talk to celebrities about what they can do to help foster kids, and I don't even know who they are most of the time. <laughs> but, anyways, the point is that I know who foster kids are. So, there's just this divide between a celebrity and influencer lifestyles and foster kid lifestyles. And so, I love the opportunity to just me, whoever I'm invited to speak to, and I'm more of a one-on-one person. 
and just try to get them to what I'm going to ask them to do is mentor foster kids. I'm setting up a mentoring system for, for celebrities and CEOs to mentor foster kids and really find the right placements because like, I've been sending out steam toys to over a thousand kids now. And still I have their contact information or at least foster parents contact information for a ton of places. <laughs> and so I, I just thought that that would be a great way to just kind of show them like, you know, I used to feel like this invisible kid, but like that one mentor, she didn't even adopt me. Um, I still had issues with her. I was like, you don't love me like your biological kids. She really didn't, it doesn't matter. You know, you can be yourself. And I think everybody has their own light. And she really made an impact on my lives. And celebrities and really anybody can for foster kids too but those that are influencers you know they have tons of people following them and so they have a wonderful rare opportunity to help them in a special way too but I like to get anybody involved <laughs> when people reach out to me and say you know how how can I help and I guess it's the same way a foster kids like let's find your skill sets and then see what you can teach foster kids if you're great with money you know you can mentor foster kids in money if you have business skills if you're good at marketing and branding you can help these these kids I mean they're just or you could help nonprofits grow I mean you can fundraise there's just so many people that can help in their own ways and they are it's very exciting that's what I get empowered of like you know it takes a whole village and and it's just great that the people like you have a podcast that they can proclaim this and it reaches so many more thousands of people and it keeps going on even after we're gone, you know, and it's just just spreading the word. Yeah. In in such a digital world, it's amazing how much, how much one person can learn and do and accomplish just because of, you know, the, the amazing opportunities available through the internet, through, you know, this, Yes, COVID has been a horrible thing for lots of people, but it's also presented a lot of opportunities in the way it's connected people virtually and made that such a natural thing to where, you know, you could get on here and interview anybody. You could talk to anybody. You can have a conversation on Zoom with a free account and talk to amazing people. And really all you need is an internet connection to do it. And you can you can affect so many lives by that and change kids who and, – and here's here's one of the things that I always tend to preach on just a little bit is that the kids that – if this little girl right here, if we can change her life, right, 20 years from now, that's a, that's a 20-year difference. And however that changes her life, if we choose to change her life – as for the better as much as we can that will change her children's lives and probably their children's lives and 100 years from today this world will be a different place because i am here because of what i do today and it's a way of just building that that legacy out over 100 years from now and if we could all just have that mentality in the things that we do as opposed to and don't get me wrong i'm not mad at sports for all the all the crazy sports guys out there I'm not a sports guy, you know, but sitting and watching football all the time and drinking beer and having no other positive impact in your world doesn't really change your world. Not at all. Not at least not for the good. It may for the neglect that may happen in your family if you're not careful. But if you change, if every one of us could just find one way to try and make that change a hundred years from today, what a different world we would live in in just five years. I mean, it can be really tempting to be comfortable. I had a really good deal. Like my first marriage, he just wanted to take care of me and make sure nobody hurt me. But I just felt it in like my soul that I cared about foster kids. I couldn't just shut it off. And I, you know, just getting out of my comfort zone and getting out there, you know, it just, it's scary perhaps, but it's adventurous and it's so much more fun, I think, than even if you can have a situation where you're completely taken care of and you're loved, like that's so boring, you know? I just hated that story of like the princess. The princess stories are the worst. Like, you know, you get married, you live happily ever after. I mean, I think happy relationships are a wonderful thing, but they're not like the end all of, you know, everything that 
to me, it's like building family and community and just getting out there and being bold and being yourself. Like it's a much greater way to be. So, I mean, even people that have these tremendous blessings, they have this wonderful family. That's great. You have an even greater support system to help these kids with. If you're friends with your neighbors and you have a great supportive spouse, it, it tests a little bit, but you have so much greater of a protagonist story <laughs> behind you. And you'll really feel proud of yourself. <laughs> Just go for it. Yeah, you know, you see so many stories where people who win the lottery end up broken and and bankrupt just a few years, short years later. And I look at that and go, it's that I'm sorry, but these are people who do not have a purpose in their life a lot of times. And it's it's obvious because you can see where, where they spend all their energy and money in. And so, God, if you're listening, um, if we were to win that 200 something million dollar Powerball right now, we could put it to good use. We could put it to good use. <laughs> Um, but but that's the thing is so many people don't have that purpose in their life they don't have that power and unfortunately so many people have a hard time finding their purpose and their power without having been through some level of pain to find it and i find that that pain is what taught me honest i have found like rich investors who do want to help these kids it's really just finding where to direct them to use their money that it, it's actually really exciting to me that that's why I need more people, even with ideas of how do you think we should best help these kids? Like I see that we could support them with adoption for one, but you know, not everybody that has money wants to adopt, you know, they want to still travel and stuff, but I mean, it's like paying for their laptops or cars so they can find a job or, you know, with their time they can mentor. But like, that's what I really want to connect is like, I think, if these people can just see these kids and get to know them and hear their needs themselves, then, you know, I can fundraise for more specific of this is exactly what they need to reach their goals. So, you know, let's raise a couple thousand for, for this kid, but just helping anybody from foster care get on their feet and really any age, because, you know, I found myself a divorced woman. He divorced me, not, you know, I guess I was just too much for him with all my dreams of needing to get out there. He he would have loved me to death and I was just a kept woman for life, but that just couldn't be me. So I had an irrecoverable differences personality to him. But anyhow, <laughs> I lost my train of thought because that was stressful. Oh yeah, I was a divorced woman, practically homeless. I hadn't had a job. He didn't want me to work for over 10 years. So you know, it was like it can be tough of any age if you didn't ever have that family support. You don't have anybody that has money. Nobody will take you in. Nobody really knows you. It's scary at any age. So I really have a passion for foster care alumni too. Just the, the suffering doesn't ever end. You know, you probably still have some of that same family alive. It still treats you exactly the same way. And so, yeah, I mean, there's so many ways to help foster kids or alumni and, I really like to just jump into all of them, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, people can focus and have a specialty and help a lot of lives in whatever way they feel called to. Yeah. I have a friend of mine, John Williams. He runs an organization called, um, a life that counts or life that counts. I think it's just life that counts. There's no way at the beginning of it. He has a podcast as well. I think he did. I don't know if it's, if he's still active with that or not, but John talks to you. He's got a Ted talk out there, but he goes out and talks to kids in high schools and and really, you know, he's always speaking to the kids with trauma in the crowd because I know him personally. I know his personal backstory, and I know that I know the trauma he experienced as a kid and what he went through as a kid, and that has that has turned into his passion for life to go out and help those kids who need that. And I think number one, the thing that needs to be discussed in this space is is more not only knowledge but but disseminating that knowledge that we have about trauma. And how much it changes kids and how it affects them and how we can effectively work through their trauma. Because when we started this, what, 12, 13 years ago? Yeah. How much did we know about trauma? Um, we knew about our own personal trauma. I, I don't but think. we didn't even call it trauma. It wasn't, it wasn't addressed as trauma then. You yeah. Know, it, it was hidden. Yeah, it you was the stuff we didn't talk Yeah, we didn't talk about. <laughs> you know, because your grand your your parents didn't talk about it. They didn't go see a therapist. They didn't take medication. No, you just suck it up and you go. And that's what you did. You know, but I know from personal experience, my childhood was not a dream childhood. 
It was a dream. Just not. <laughs> it wasn't my dream. <laughs> Nightmare. It wasn't, it wasn't many others' dreams either. And I fell through the cracks of a system that did not catch me. I did not have anyone. I didn't get put in foster care. I didn't get rescued. I was not a princess. You know, and so Jason's right when when he says we take our pain and we do something with it. And if you don't, you're not finding your purpose. You know, I knew from the time I was a little bitty girl at five years old, taking care of my first sibling, changing diapers and him sleeping in bed with me and me taking care of an infant at five years old. I knew I was going to be a mother and I was going to be a mother of many. I could only birth two but I have almost eight children right now and I'll probably continue forever and ever, you know, but you, you take what you have and you work with it and you expand and that's really what you're doing and everybody can do something. Yeah. I, that's why I'm so glad you're here too, because I heard your story and it was so powerful. I just wanted you to know that, that you sharing your story. I mean, it brought me to tears and I'm like, yeah, I'm, Absolutely. People need to hear, you know, your heart for how you got into it and that you really, you really care, you know. And um, again, not all foster parents are like that. We need so many more like you, you know, just high quality people that, that truly care. But there are some out there and I'm so thankful for you. And I'm so thankful for your voice that you're willing to put that on display because people really need to see that good example. Yeah, I, I'll be careful with the with calling it high quality people because so many people with an experience like ours do not consider it high quality. You know, we're all broken goods. We're all broken goods. It's just the people who who have been broken who are willing to to try and help help seal up some of those fissures in the souls of others. And it, it's well, you don't feel you like know high Bible quality. verse that God binds up the brokenhearted. I had a Christian counselor who told me that when I was younger and he said, you know, the word binds up in the Hebrew or whatever, <laughs> I don't know, Bible slavery said, it doesn't actually mean like, like sew it or whatever we might think. It's like as if it was never broken though. And I really am a believer in, I mean, yes, we're all flawed. We're all sinful. Like nobody's perfect or whatever is my belief, but it's like, it's still, it's like we are, we are like gods, you know, we all have a powerful story. We all have like this miraculous lung oxygen <laughs> breathing into us. And, and it, it, we're more powerful than we realize here. And the brokenness is how you help heal people. So just share the brokenness and then help share like what has helped in your healing journey is that you can go on to heal so many there you really can be completely healed from all trauma it's not easy you know you have to be like <laughs> a brain scientist I had I had a different Christian counselor telling me that as an adult so like it's not going to be easy for you you're going to have to master your brain more than any neural surgeon I mean but you really can if you understand the way the cells are I mean you really it, it it's like to simplify it, like gratitude and appreciation can help heal you, but it's really hard to do that when everybody has treated you wrong, <laughs> you know, when, you, when you're like homeless on the street, didn't really do anything at all to ever deserve that, try to be a model citizen, you're over there sharing stories with a homeless person or like, you know, what happened to you? I mean, you can be angry, you know, and that's not going to heal the brain. So it's just really finding positive experiences in your life like actively seeking them out actively seeking out who you want to be visualizing it like you just have to aim for I can be completely healed you know I'm not just going to live some half-hearted life of being broken I mean to admit you know I make mistakes and stuff it used to be human but I just I'm really against any kind of social stigma foster kid or alumni or anybody who's independent at young age or just so broken because hurting people do hurt people but you really can't heal yourself in every way if you're just open to it yeah that i've heard that line hurt people hurt people and i, I don't deny that a bit but i think the other side of that is that healed people help others to heal and that's that's the choice that you have to make and it's 
it's a hard choice because it really let's let's just be honest when once you've been hurt it's it's really easy to just hurt others and keep everything at an arm's length but to do the hard work to to find the healing in yourself and then to bring others along your journey to heal alongside of you to create that environment where you're not seeking out the broken things to be angry about but to seek out the the places where you can help others heal that's a life worth living Hey there, Foster Care Nation. If you'd like to find yourself in a group with like-minded people, head over to Facebook, and you can find us at facebook.com slash groups slash foster care UJ. We've got a group over there where we talk about foster care, we talk about adoption, and we talk about all the things related. If your podcast player allows it, you can also reach down and hit that subscribe button so you get notified every week when we put up uploads. Every Tuesday, a new episode comes out. We'd love to see you next week. Now back to the show. Yeah, and I love that you guys are together and all lovey-dovey. I'm in a relationship, but I've heard so many people say like they never got to the point of healing to ever have a romantic relationship even. And it's so sad. It's like, I'm glad that, I mean, it shows that you guys have this long-term relationship and it is trying on any family to have young kids, let alone young kids that aren't yours and stuff that you guys are united in this and even finding time to do these podcasts. You all are serious miracle workers. So, I mean, we need, I need to, which places an interview you next time is need to get the story out of you. Like I'm interested in what filled in those gaps of brokenness. Like how did you get from where you started off in life to this amazing power couple that you are? That's what I consider a power couple, like together changing lives. It, it's a very happy love story. You know, it's, it's been a journey. It was a journey that I I didn't think I deserved, you know, it took me a really long time to uh, believe that, 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 that was what we had, you know, oh. and, and the thing is, oh, thank you, Mrs. Little one just burped for us all. <laughs> um, but, you know, the thing is, is me and Jason, we have been through so much as a couple, you know, and the biggest thing is we just keep talking to each other. We never stop talking to each other. When things get hard, you can't uh, you can't push out the one that loves you, or you will be alone eventually, you know. But we have been through so much. We've had almost thirty children come through our home. We lost our daughter, you know, to an to almost an incurable disease. You know, our family has been through hell and back, but we just keep talking. <laughs> You know, I think part of part of the magic of our story has also been that, you know, I mean, she'll tell her story pretty openly. And, you know, she grew up in, in a place that was had a lot of, of drug abuse and a lot of other horrible things happen and what the world would consider maybe the outlaw side of things, a lot of crime. I came from from a family full of police officers. That That's my background. She came from a family that had I mean, they went to church on Christmas and Easter religiously every year whether they needed it or not and that was it we grew up in a church that was a much more fundamentalist group and you were there three times a week and and yeah, i learned I, I learned some some unfortunate messaging from that experience in in my, the church that i grew up in and since we have such polar different um experiences on all those aspects i think some of the places where i was truly broken and needed needed some healing and some of the places where she was broken and needed some real healing, we both came from such an opposite experience that we, through that communication that Amanda was talking about, we were able to kind of, kind of push experiences, you know, our experiences together and maybe help the other one to see a different viewpoint that's possible and to begin some of that healing process. And it took me years to learn. You know, I used to always say that, you know, because Amanda does not have a, a relationship with her father at all. She's only her, her biological father. She's only met him a couple times in her life. And I used to always say, you know, yeah, it's it's my job to heal the sins of the father. You know, that that's the husband's job. And it wasn't until later that I realized it's not my job to heal her sins or he, heal his sins and heal the brokenness in her. My job is just to create an environment where that's possible. And for her, the same thing is we learn to, to step into one another's brokenness and be open and vulnerable and have that safe relationship together so that we could begin to heal in our own spaces. And that's been, that's been really the secret sauce for us still being together after all, you know, Amanda, she mentioned about half the traumas that, that I could come up with off the top of my head that we've been through. But yeah, the, the things we've been through because we could sit shoulder to shoulder, 
side by side and not fight with one another. But, you know, the hardship has made us stand together as a team, us against the world, as opposed to us fighting each other. And that mentality right there allows us to really work on each other together so that we can we can overcome whatever may come in front of us. So we're going to I don't care who you are, what you're going to bring us. We're going to defeat you. Because we have the power of one another and our experience and our our history and our pain that we have been able to draw on. And you can't overcome that. Yeah, I, I think more people just need that kind of community. It can be powerful if you use it to unite one another. But there there is a lot of brokenness a lot of times. And, you know, like alumni coming together, you know, I, I think there is a lot of anger, you know, just towards the system in general and, and, you know, people not even being able to get along sometimes in the foster care community. But I just love that, that story when you can use that hurt to bring, bring each other together and work towards, we have the same exact goal. We want people to hurt less, you know, we want to, we want to change the world for the better and that it's more loving place and accepting place. And, and yeah, that's exactly what I seek is like just that family kind of community of people who really love foster kids. Just people don't even have to like me. I just like, I love you so much. If you're just making a difference in these kids' lives, if you have something that you're willing to say publicly to help people to pay attention to this cause, this is a very important cause it's not you know there's so many great causes you know I again I've been a part of those but this is you know I think the most important cause of our time I think that churches you need to unite no matter what you believe you know I have friends that are Jewish satanic you know all, all walks of life I mean really as long as you're loving our kids I just think we all should just unite in supporting foster kids to just find their voice, find their self-esteem. Uh, yeah, I'm just biased against people who do not truly have love in their hearts. There are there are people that do it for vanity, you know, and it's kind of making me sick. Like, I've really been trying to separate myself from those people that just seem a little too perfect, you know, because I guess maybe I just like broken people, if you want to put it like that. Like, people who are honest about it and use their story to heal people are not broken to me. Those are just the most authentic people out there. They're so lovable. But when people need to be like perfect and holier than thou and like, you know, prettier and richer than everybody else on the planet, it's like, how are they going to help foster kids? Like they're just always going to want them to be below them. They're always going to want them to be like, Oh, they're just a charity case to me. As soon as they start rising above that, we're just going to do the social stigma of y'all are hurting and we just felt sorry for you and throw them under the bus. I mean, it's just, there's, there are people that are just motivated by bad motives. And even if they're doing wonderful things, it's like, part of me wants to be like, well, they're caring about this cause at least. But another part of me is like, you know, we need to just get the, the corrupt people. I don't care what they believe. If they're doing it out of, you know, selfish ambition or vanity, like just, get out <laughs> don't you do, work on veterans or something else like we don't need your charity case work hey as a veteran myself we don't want them over there either <laughs> <laughs> and that all goes back to that purpose i think not not everybody's wired to do this i know i know you know mm -hmm. and i've told the case workers in our area before you know our um our, our place in life involves addicted children especially newborns Give me an addicted baby, and I, I, I that's that's the world. I, I'm good there. I, I'm not scared of that. I know a lot of people can't handle that. The the constant crying that comes from that. You know, some people can't handle that. And if you're not wired for that, my God, please do not step into that arena. If you're not, if God did not put you on this earth for that reason, if you don't know God put you here for that, do not do it. We don't want you in that space. But what we do want you to do is go out and figure out what it is that you are wired to do. If God puts you here on this earth, in this time, you have a purpose, go find it and chase it with everything you have. Figure out what it is that sets your soul on fire and then go chase it. Make the world a different place. And, and that's that's kind of what I, what I see in, in, this, in this whole area is, yeah, a lot of people, you might not be, 
you might not be inspired to help foster kids. And if that's if that's you, that's fine. I'm not mad at you. As long as you're doing something to make the world a better place. Because, you know, I, I find the foster kids story really important. I also happen to know that that all these kids, we're either going to help them now, you know, little baby girl over here who's kind of fussing and, and all that. It, we're going to either help her now. Somebody's going to help her now in this point in her life. Or we're going to deal with her later, 20 years from now, when she enters the the, the justice system. Because... The statistics are horrible for kids who age out of care without any real connection. So we can do it today or we can do it in 20 years. And 20 years from now, it's going to be a lot more of a mess to deal with. So I would rather take the screaming baby all day, every day, than have to watch more young women end up become mamas whose kids go into foster care themselves and mom ends up in in prison for something ridiculous and just repeating that cycle. So that's that's really part of our mission is just breaking that cycle so that more moms don't create more kids who don't have that connection that they want. Well, I wanted to encourage you guys that I had a foster sister who was raised by that foster mom that I was talking about. And she was born addicted to all kinds of drugs. And she was told like she would never speak or at least she'd have a serious speaking delay. And when I met her at three years old, she just pointed at me like she wanted to play with me. She couldn't speak. And she she was a little beauty pageant queen. She learned to speak, not to speak, but she has the talent for writing and music and singing now. And I mean, really, truly, I don't even know. She knew that she was born addicted to drugs. It's just... He, really the the power of being a loving parent like treating a kid as if they're your own young and being just a really amazing parent in general you can you can rise above nearly anything I mean you guys are doing a wonderful thing there and if you know if you get lucky enough to adopt her one day and then just you know nurture her, her talents like I don't really believe that she'll probably have delays if if someone has a loving parent behind them they're going to be more advanced than their peers. They have an advantage. And so, yeah, thank you guys for taking her in. Oh, we, we are blessed to have her. Honestly, we, we've learned that lesson about kids because we have lots of kids. Actually, I think all the kids in our house right now have some sort of drug exposure in their early childhood or in utero, one of the two. And that's one thing we can say, you know, our little, our six year old, I'm going to tell you, most people would find him an extreme challenge because if you look ADHD up in the DSM, his picture is right there. Um, but he is the most amazing little guy. And I, it's taken a lot of years to learn this and a lot of people to teach me. But my job isn't to like take him to the doctor and get him labeled so we can give him some medication and make him neurotypical. That's not going to happen for him. He's not going to be neurotypical, but he's going to have some superpowers. And our job is to nurture that. You know, my the six year old, he has he has that. The eight year old, he has some some superpowers in there as well. And I see those, and some of those are are totally different from the other other kids. And it's our job to nurture that. He can be the most loving little guy. I, at eight years old, he every day I I think when he comes home from school, he, he wants to take the baby and sit and hold the. You know, he wants a newborn baby so he can sit and hold her and and love on her and feed her and take care of her and and you see that loving nature come out and we just have to support that instead of worrying about whether or not all the benchmarks of of neurotypical development are being hit because they're not going to be hit for our kids. They're not going to hit those at, at the the standard ages. They're going to have some delays. But they're also going to have some superpowers that come out of their own trauma. And if we can figure that out, figure out how to how to meet these kids and find their superpower inside of their, their trauma, we can really help them grow in a way that no one else will be able to grow. They will be unique, one-of-a-kind kids. And that's that's part of what I've learned on our journey is that's our job is to figure out how we can find that and nurture that for them. Yeah. I agree fully. There was one thing I disagreed with you, but you said it a little while back of just, you said if you don't absolutely know you have a calling for this, that you don't think that they should be doing foster care work. And, you know, I just, I literally slept overnight at the CPS building and, you know, there's like homeless people walking in and out. It didn't feel safe. And you just feel unloved because there is 
<laughs> there's all these people um that they're calling that are rejecting you essentially like i know she's a teenager but you know she seems really sweet she doesn't seem like she'll harm anything and you just hear the no 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 click like over and over again and so i mean i i feel like almost anybody who would really care about these kids probably has some brokenness in them you know that made them want to care you know because I think if people are like really happy and succeeding, they don't want to look at the people that are struggling. But a lot of us know, you know, what it's like to really struggle and feel troubled that do this. And so and I had somebody tell me when I first started getting into foster care that I wasn't cut out for it, that I needed like a lifetime of counseling, you know, before I'd probably be able to help a kid. And it's probably, and it was actually pretty true. I mean, I, I have done a lot of this out of a place of pain. I just didn't want others to feel pain like I did. And that led the way, but oh, I just, if somebody is taking in a kid, nobody's perfect. You know, they're giving them a place to stay. They're at least accepting them. Even if they can't really find it in their heart to love these kids quite like their own kids. I personally am very grateful for them. I mean, if it comes from a place of knowing they're not perfect, but they don't want to just wait around until they feel like ready to take them in or a place where they're absolutely sure this is their life calling to do. I mean, everybody can do something right as they are. You know, we're all imperfect people. We're never going to be perfect. Just knowing you know, I think just recognizing where your flaws are is beautiful. You know, if you can accept that about yourself, you're in a wonderful position to accept a kid that's also going to be very flawed, very imperfect. So that's my two cents. It's just we still need a ton more homes. Just it's it's hard to take in kids temporarily and then give them back to their biological parents. It takes a special heart for that. And there's always going to be a shortage of people willing to do that. Oh, I agree. I agree. And and my my point really is that for the people who have thought about it, who who feel like this might be something they need to look into, yes, for sure look into that. But if you, if it's if you've got the wrong motivation behind it, that's you you're not the right people. If you're trying to do it for money, if your your finances are are having some trouble and you think we can make some money doing this, go away. I don't want the people trying to make money in here because you're going to further damage these kids. It's not unless you are somebody who wants to do this for the reason of helping kids. And other than that, we don't want you here. You know, if you if you're going to take a, a newborn infant in because you think you can you can have the case. I, I some states I forget uh, we talked with um, uh, Jen Lilly. She's an actress, and uh, she talked about being at um out in, out in uh, California at a oh some sort of a foster care um, symposium and there was somebody there a woman she talked to who told her oh no no honey you have to you have to get them rated right this you have to get them th- that and you can make all this money and you know and thank god her her reaction to the lady was you need to step away before i smack you i, I want to punch <laughs> you in the head right now and those are the people who we absolutely do not want because if if you're working on on finding ways to make more money and make it a some sort of a profitable venture <sighs> I don't know. I don't feel like you can say you're you're out there, you know, trying to have the best interest of kids at heart. Now, if you can walk in and, and think about the kids and worry about helping the kids through their trauma, if that's something that you think you might be good at, yeah, go ahead. Let's give this a shot and, and you know, join the system because we need more of that. But we need more people who think that way and are willing to step into it, are willing to act because people are afraid to act on this because it's scary. Mm-hmm. If you might have to yeah, people, get back, it's scary. Yeah, I had, like you said, seven placements in the year I was in foster care. So I got a good assortment of, I was in relative placements, so I was in a group home, I was in a couple of foster homes. And I had one foster mom who was clearly in it for the money. I mean, it was like indentured slavery, and she wanted me to take care of all of her special needs kids that she got extra money for and she didn't care she kind of neglected them and stuff so I was the foster mom like there's those stories for sure but there's also I mean the opposite end of it of my that foster mom who changed my life like I didn't even stay with her for very long but like she really cared at least on some level she at least related and my dad 
my parents, they were very jealous. They didn't want anybody to adopt me, even though they gave up the parental rights right away. They just, at some level, felt like I was still their daughter and they didn't want anybody to help me. They wanted me to be like homeless and just suffer or something, but they didn't want her to help me. And she really hung in there like a champion. I mean, it wasn't easy to love me for many reasons. I mean, I wasn't acting in the most lovable way. And, but she just treated me like a mother overall and didn't give up on me. But I mean, my parents tried to make her life a living hell. And I just know that to really stick through a kid with that comes from a really abusive family. Um, yeah, I mean, she really saw my side of it. She really thought the answer, like she thought kids were precious. I really got that feeling. Like even though she's admitted she, you know, biological kids are, are different. She was only allowed to have this one miracle baby. She always had trouble conceiving it, but she did um, give the rest of us a very good life, like the life that she wanted and stuff. And so it's like, she was very imperfect, but it just taught me like, she has bipolar, she has all kinds of issues and stuff herself, but she's medicated and, and she just does the best she can. So it's just like, I get very defensive of, you know, foster parents like her, like for sure, she's still not perfect. And she kind of even said she did it for the money one. And I just don't believe it. Like regardless, it changed my life. You know what I mean? Like to have an honest, authentic person who's just putting their soul into championing for this cause makes a difference even if you're completely like hurting and imperfect and never healed like a for effort you really do get an a for effort yeah i'll agree because i mean definitely we do not fall into the category of the people who are not broken or are or are perfect uh, you we, and it's through those broken places that we have been able to really provide care to kids in places where they needed it because I can understand some of some of their struggles. I can understand for them what what it's like to not be perfect and for people to look down on you. You know, I grew up in that space to some extent. I mean, my my parents were were fine loving parents and and all that. And, you know, I didn't have that same childhood abuse experience, but I did have some I did have some people in my life who who really looked down and I felt that a lot, very deeply. And it wasn't until I got old enough to realize that, hey, wait, I, I figured out how to walk out of that. And maybe I could hand that to a kid. Maybe I could hand that, that pathway to kids. And it's been really amazingly helpful for us to be able to take some of our own pain and share the lessons learned there and help kids go from a place of hurt to a place of success, which is what it really sounds like you have done throughout this journey. Yeah, I just ask that anybody who's tempted to criticize someone who's in the trenches, making a difference in the foster care system somehow, like, if you have the time to go judge and observe and criticize these people, you have extra time to actually be making a difference in these foster kids' lives. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say is just, I, I have this thing of like, I'm never going to look at a problem unless if I'm looking for the solution and have the time and energy and desire to find the solution and be a part of the solution. So that's what I just wish like people just come from it from a point of put yourself in the other person's shoes that you're trying to help. If you can't do that, don't get involved in this. But if you can do that, again, we're all imperfect people and that we're even imperfect helps us relate to them. Like it, it's all good. Just be proud of yourself. You don't have to be perfect. Do everything right. It's just, just empathy is all I ask. Just have empathy for these kids. Like, like veterans, like you said, a lot of people really honor our veterans. A lot of people really can put themselves in that place of you risk our lives for our freedom. And, you know, that's why they want to support veterans, you know, as do I, but not too many people, even the ones that are involved in foster care, really actually put themselves in the foster kids place. Like they're, there's like observable facts that I hear a lot of foster parents or, you know, people that are training social or whatever, like say, like they don't come into foster care with very much stuff. And so you might want to get them a few things, but you know, I was just listening to something like that. And again, I was a foster kid. I was the one that didn't have anything when I went into foster care. My foster mom really advocated for me to go back home and take a bag so I could have even one bag of anything 
but feeling like the foster kid, you know, I remember it didn't matter to me. I lost my whole world, didn't have a family, didn't have anybody who cared about me. None of my friends even seemed to notice that I disappeared from the world. I wasn't in school. I was just um, you know, completely brokenhearted. It wasn't in high school. All those dreams again in the Harvard. It's like, well, that's not going to happen now. And I just cried and cried and cried. And, you know, all I really cared when I did get to go back and retrieve some stuff were just some cards from friends, like when I had moved of just that they cared about me. Yeah, I mean, not everybody's like me, you know, not everybody's just so sentimental like that. But I'm just saying, like, a lot of the nonprofits, even if they're good nonprofits, I just feel like you can make a more potent difference if you're just really putting yourself in the place of foster kids because it takes a lot of time and money donations to make any nonprofit go. But I just I, I really like to support there are so many different ways to make like a powerful impact. You just put yourself in their shoes and just I understand like. What you really need is some inspiration. What you really need is people who will prove that they really care about you. Um, They really don't need money unless that that money is helping you believe in yourself. So that's my two cents about what nonprofits are good to support. Well, I'm not going to argue with that a bit because all that is very, very important. You know, as... As we've walked this journey, I found that there are a handful of people out there that are doing things horribly. And there is a lot of people who who are working their best to try and do to make the biggest difference they they possibly can. And you know, you're talking about the people who who look down and then who who want to be judgmental about it. And I'm always tempted to recite the the speech given by Teddy Roosevelt, but I can't remember it well enough to recite the whole thing. But it was part of this fireside chats where he says, you know, that to the the to the victor, you know, or not to the victor, the, to the one um, who, who deserves to to have some recognition, some some of the glory is the one who stands in that arena, the one who fights, whose face is marred by sweat and blood, who who does what needs to be done, even though he knows that most likely he will fail, uh, he, he'll still fight for what is right, regardless of what the outcome is, and the the real the real reward there is that he is never going to be one of those cold and timid souls who stands and and uh criticizes the doer of deeds and as opposed to actually making that difference themselves and i think that's such an important thing i totally massacred that by the way if anybody wants to find it i had posted that on my facebook page too yeah it recently is what really adds the powerful um impact of that quote is that he is a handicapped man Mm -hmm. speaking this who was our u.s president (laughs) you know we elected him as a world leader so he knows all about turning a hopeless situation into one of the most powerful figures in our history that's the part that gets me it's like no matter what you believe in politics you've got to respect the person who came from that underdog of a story and did not feel hopeless found some resiliency in him and made a difference he left his mark in this world flawed as he was (laughs) handicapped as he was he was very capable Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, so it's, it's the man in the arena speech. If somebody wants to find it, look up the man in the arena and Teddy Roosevelt, and you'll, you'll find that speech pretty quickly. But I think that's so important to remember that, that we do what we can as best we can when we can and, and make that, make that change in the world that we, that we so much desire to see. And, you know, for, for obviously for my wife and I, and for you, Cheryl, that, that means taking care of kids in care in some way or another, because those are the populations that God put us on this earth to serve. And I found that there are two calls that I cannot ignore. One of those is when my wife calls me, I'm supposed to answer that call. And when God calls, those are the two, not necessarily in that order, but I have to follow those callings because that that's, that's what makes a difference in my life is to go make that change. And that's really what I was talking about earlier, even is that knowing what that calling is and, and refusing to hide from it to stand in that place, even when you don't know that you know how to do it. Cause, um, I don't think we knew what we were doing when we got started. We were kind of clueless, but we were just, we were called in that direction. So we followed that calling and to date it has changed, you know, it has changed. I'll say at least the lives of our family, 100%. And 
some portion of those almost 30 kids that have come through our house as well. We've changed some lives in some ways that will never even understand the, the impact, the depth of that impact, or how far out that change will go into, into our future because our legacy is something that we get to leave behind us. And we have to choose what that is. We don't get to choose whether or not we leave a legacy because even abusive parents leave a legacy. It's not a great one, but you get to choose what yours is. And that's what we do. And that's what you're doing. And so we just want to really just honor you, Cheryl, for, for coming out of a hard place and being willing to change your story into something instead of being a victim, being the person who's out there supporting others, helping others, coming from that place where you're, you're working through your own healing and using that to help others heal. And I just want to say that what you've done is amazing. What you continue to do is amazing. And anybody who wants to find you and, and go out and jump on your bandwagon and help other kids, um, it is, what is it? Fundfc.org, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, sorry. Yes, and my email address is Cheryl at fundfc.org. Okay, and and I can make certain that all of that ends up in the uh, in the show notes, so that if anybody wants to find it, you can just look in the show notes. To be fair, we've had something weird go on with Apple Podcast, and so if you go to look at the the show notes in Apple Podcast, most of the links do not work, and it has something to do with Apple. And if you want to get a hold of their customer service for me, because I can't seem to figure out <laughs> how to make that that change in the show notes, so if it doesn't work, you can always copy and paste. Or um, if you go to fostercarenation.com, on the top left, hit the the um, the podcast blog, and then the the show will be in there, and you can find everything. All those links are active. I, I can put those in. I own that website. I can make sure that they actually work there. So if you're listening on Apple and it doesn't work, you can go find all those links and find Cheryl in the show notes. One more thing. Just another way people can get involved is by babysitting for foster parents. So wonderful people like you can get a break sometimes to help with sanity. I mean, it doesn't guarantee sanity, but it can help. I've done that before. And there's a lot of people that just want to interact with foster kids, but maybe like single parents or they don't have extra beds. You can foster even as a single parent, by the way, but um, just for people that don't feel like they can right now, there's so many ways you can help out, including babysit, like respite care for you wonderful providers. Wait, are we supposed to be working on keeping our sanity? <laughs> what sanity? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've lost that at this point, but maybe we'll get it back. That's for others to help you work on that. <laughs> Give you a break sometimes. <laughs> That's mm-hmm. awesome. Well, I appreciate your time today, Cheryl. I appreciate you guys so much. Keep up the good work, guys. And gal. <laughs> Gals. Is that baby a girl? Yeah. Yep. Guy and gal. <laughs> You're yep. precious. Okay, Foster Care Nation. Thank you for listening to Cheryl's story. Now take her knowledge and wisdom to heart so you can create love and healing in your family and community. Be sure to come back next week. We have new episodes every Tuesday. If you'd like to share your story as a guest, you can reach us at Foster Care Nation. Dot com. You can connect with other like-minded people on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash foster care UJ. And don't forget, we have an account at Buy Me A Coffee. It's like a virtual tip jar where you can help us fund our mission for as little or as much as you'd like. It's at buymeacoffee.com slash foster care. The links to everything are in the show notes on your podcast player or at fosterCareNation.com. And as always, you are so super awesome. I thank you guys so go go go. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for listening. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Foster Care Nation, listen up. That's what I say every week. This week, I want to listen to you guys. If you would, you're going to hear Cheryl talk in this episode a little bit about looking for ways that we can serve foster kids. I'd love to hear your suggestions. Also, You can leave us some stories if you have a story or something you'd like to share, something that we can play on the podcast episode, give us a call at 413-FOSTER-3. Again, that's 413-367-8373. And let us know if you have any ideas. Unparalleled Studios.